Matthew Dix, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, <laughs> among your many jobs that you've had or are currently doing right <laughs> now, your endeavors, I could say, you were or you still are a wedding DJ? Are you still? I am. I am a, a less frequent, but still a wedding DJ. I've done uh, maybe three this year, and I, I know we have two more for next year, so we'll, we're entering year 20 six of the business <laughs> wow 26 years holy cow yeah you have seen a I lot seen it all <laughs> well i was going to ask you if you have any like really good like dreadful you know wedding dj stories i have a lot of them um yeah. <laughs> many grace us with one <laughs> I, I guess the one that i recently told on stage was uh, the story of the this bride who disappeared in the middle of the wedding, which has happened oddly before. Okay. And so I went looking for this particular bride and I eventually found her in the parking lot. She was sitting on the ground in her bridal gown, leaning up against the tire of a truck and oh she was smoking a cigarette. And uh, I came up to her and I said, what's going on? And she said that she smokes and that her husband, her new husband, doesn't know that she smokes. <laughs> <laughs> she had kept it from him and she had promised herself that she would quit on her wedding day. And halfway through her wedding day, she had realized that's not how it works. And she didn't know what to do. And so she was crying and smoking and sort of escaping her wedding. So I had to sit down with her and we charted a course on how she would break this news to her newly married man, not on this particular evening, but, you know, right. the next night. Uh, and, uh, if she said it right and, you know, used good words, he would support her and I'm sure she would get through it. And so I managed to pull her back together and bring her to the party and she had a great time. And I don't know what happened thereafter. I'm just hoping that it all worked out. Wow. That's impressive because usually if somebody is a smoker, you know, it's obviously lingering on their clothes. I mean, I had, I remember I dated a girl back in my old college days that was a smoker you kissed him you knew immediately you know they yeah. were a smoker i think it was tricky I, I know they weren't living together until they got married and she had a roommate who smoked so i think she was just mm. passing it off as i live with a smoker therefore i smell like smoke when really she was also a smoker yeah my brother used to say it's like kissing an ashtray and they're like okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was so, one of many one that, of many situations i've encountered over the years well it sparked a lot of memories for me because I thought to myself, my brother was a DJ in uh, college and I would sub for him every now and then, you know, he was having too much fun somewhere. He's like, Hey, can you cover my shift? I'm like, sure. Why not? You know? And those were the days of vinyl with the two turntables and you know, it was awesome. It was just awesome. I love music. And it sparked these memories in my brain. One of my best friends got married shortly after I did, you know, we're all in our like early twenties and right out of college. And they um, really liked Depeche Mode. And there was a song that they wanted played, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the DJ played the wrong song. It was a song about a suicide. Yeah. <laughs> and the look on the bride's face, everyone's looking at each other like, I think this is the wrong song, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Those things happen that um, that that can be a problem. So uh, good communication is um, es essential when it comes to being a wedding DJ. You really want to know exactly what they want going into that day, oftentimes because at some point they're unable to tell you anymore what they want. So you have to, you know, I always tell them, you're going to tell me what you want and then you can get amnesia on your wedding day and I'll just make all those things happen and you won't have to remember anymore. That's always my goal. So, <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> so you shared a room with a goat, you know, <laughs> I did. <laughs> but, you know, and I was thinking to myself today, I'm like, people would probably pay for that experience today. I mean, not that it was super awesome for you, but there's goat yoga, you know, the goat experience. Could you kind of fill us in a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I was homeless for a period of time. I, uh, I was arrested and uh, tried for a crime I did not commit. And while I was awaiting trial, you know, sort of my arrest and my arraignment caused me to lose my job. And you know, it was back in 92. Hmm. And so I ended up homeless and I couldn't get a job because in 92, to have a phone, you needed to own a wall to put the phone on to <laughs> yeah. get a job. And so if yeah. you couldn't own a wall, you couldn't get a phone, then you couldn't get a job. So I was just sort of doing day labor. I was uh, working at construction sites, making, you know, like $3 an hour to collect scraps that guys would throw down from the roof. And uh, I would sell things. Uh, there was a 
there was a perfume company in Somerville, Massachusetts that would give you samples to sell on the street and you could make a dollar for every sample that you sold. So I wasn't like, wasn't doing very well. You know, I was yeah. making just enough money to sort of feed myself every day. And a family who I had hired at a McDonald's I was working at, you know, a year before found out that I ha I was on the street and I was homeless and they took me in and uh, they allowed me to live with them. They converted a pantry off their kitchen into a bedroom. Originally, um, it was the goat's bedroom. And so the goat was still there. There was actually another guy there too. There's a guy named Rick. We were on army cots and Rick was a Jehovah's Witness. They, this was a family of Jehovah's Witnesses. And okay. so Rick was one of them and he would speak in tongues in his sleep. <laughs> And so I would sleep next to Rick while he was speaking in tongues and the goat who would chew on my hair and stick its tongue in my ear. And <laughs> if I moved my toe, my feet at night, it would bite my feet like I'm trying to play with it. Uh, so I shared a room for about, got a little, a little less than a year, I think, with that goat. But, you know, I was working eventually when, now that I had a phone, I, I started working two full time jobs to pay for the attorney so that I could um, not go to prison. And so I wasn't there very much, honestly. I, I, did, I worked two full-time jobs for about 18 months to pay a $25,000 legal fee. So I, what was I, the goat's name? Goat. Actually, the <laughs> goat's name was Goat. Very original. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh. you're talking about you were arrested and tried for a crime you didn't commit. Yeah. As, you know, being a cop for 25 years, that's very foreign to me because almost everybody I ever arrested, you know, it didn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure it out. Yeah. You know, okay. Dude running down the street with knife in his hand who just stabbed his best friend, you right. know, a lot of like domestic violence stuff, uh, stealing cars, you know, whatever. So that's wow. I mean, anything, anything can happen, I guess, but could you kind of explain that? That's, that's crazy to me. Yeah. Well, I was managing a McDonald's restaurant, um, on Cape Cod and I was, um, finishing my shift and I had to bring three deposits to the bank and drop them in the night drop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back in the day, we would take those night, those night bags, those deposit bags, and we put them in a paper bag to make it look like we were carrying food to the car sure, so that people didn't know what we actually had. And so I left the McDonald's that night with my briefcase and a bag full of deposit bags and a, a gym bag to go to the gym. And I walked out to my car and, you know, it was a day when you had to put a key actually in a lock to open a door. <laughs> yeah. And so I put everything on my roof and this is, I'm assuming what happened. I put everything on my roof and I had a roof rack, mm -hmm. you know, so I sort of like right on the other side of the roof rack, I opened the door. And I think what happened was when I pulled everything back down, two of those bags slipped out onto the or, or one of those bags slipped out onto the beyond the roof rack so i couldn't see it and so only two bags were now in that paper bag instead oh, of three boy. and so when i get to the bank i dropped two but i didn't drop the third and i didn't know it and so you know a couple days later my boss called me and said hey we're missing a deposit now oddly that happened a lot people really? would just accidentally drive home with the money and go like oh my god it's still in my car that was just a it was odd i eventually okay. went to work for a bank and like money stops becoming money to you when you work with it like okay. it was just like a cheeseburger to me, you know, the money. Right. So I thought, wow, it must be still in my car. And I looked at my car. It wasn't there. You know, we sort of did a search. Sometimes you would accidentally leave it at the restaurant. You were supposed to bring it to the bank, but you didn't bring it to the bank. And now it's mm -hmm. still in the safe somewhere. Sure. Well, it never turned up. It was about $7,000. So I, you know, I said, it's, it's on me. I'll, I'll pay it back. And my boss said, you're not paying it back. This has happened before. It's fine. But we need to go to the police to report the loss for the insurance company. Insurance. Yeah, yeah. And so when I went to the police station with my boss, I ran into a police officer who, for some reason, took one look at me and thought, you took that money, buddy. And uh, <laughs> for a week. Yeah. So for a week, I was interrogated three separate times. So I was interrogated that day, you know, and I did some really dumb things. You know, I told him what I thought happened. And then he took me in the back. You know, he said, well, now we're going to ask you some questions without your boss, you know, in private. Yeah. And when I got into that little room, the first thing he did was slide a card across the table and said, this is a waiver of your Miranda rights. We want to question you without an attorney. And I <laughs> thought in my mind, if I ask for an attorney, it's going to make me look guilty. You know, I'm 20 years old, right. I don't know anything. I don't have parents. I don't have anyone in my life to support me. Sure. So I waived my Miranda rights. And then right away, he started asking me about drugs. Like, what drugs do you use? What drugs do you sell? And oddly, in my entire life, I have never used an illegal drug. I was kicked out of my house by my parents when I was 18. 
Mm -hmm. When that happened, I made the conscious decision that with no safety net in my life, I am not going to involve myself with drugs because if I end up in any kind of trouble, there's no one to save me. And so although my friends might have been using drugs around me, sure, I had never used drugs, nor had I ever bought or sold drugs. So for some reason, this guy was sure of it. So he questioned me for a couple hours that night. And then three days later, he called me back in. And now there was two guys across the table from me. And, you know, one of them was very nice to me. And the other one was mean to me. Ooh, good cop, bad cop. Look yeah. at that. And so I was there for about four hours. And um, I just didn't know what to do. I wanted to leave, but I was afraid to ask to leave. And eventually they let me go. And yeah. then about three days later, he called me, said, we got just a couple more questions. Come on down and uh, we'll wrap this up. And when I got there, um, there was a sergeant. and um, you know, he said, we're not going to ask you any questions. We're going to arrest you today for grand larceny. Wow. Um, but you can confess and you won't go to prison. But if you don't confess, I guarantee you'll spend five years in prison. And wow. so I was actually ready to confess. You know, people say, why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit? I was ready to do it. I was hmm. so terrified. Yeah. The only problem was they wanted me to tell them what I did with the money. And I had no earthly way of explaining how someone could spend $7,000 in a week and have nothing to show for it. Right. You know, they wanted me to say drugs and I probably would have said it if I could have, but I didn't know where to buy drugs. I didn't know how much they cost. <laughs> I didn't know like to say whether I bought a bag or a vial or a container. Like I knew nothing. Right. And so um, I asked them, I said, can I just have a few minutes to think, please? And they said, sure. And I thought they were going to just leave the room. Mm -hmm. They took me out of the room. They brought me down a hallway to a set of stairs into the basement of the police station. And they put me in a broom closet in the basement without a light and closed the door. I remember I had one foot in a mop sink, one foot on the floor and I was in the dark and they said, don't come out till you confess, till you're ready to confess. And wow. um, yeah, it was terrifying. And how small of a department was this? Uh, the Bourne police department. Uh, so, you know, not very big. I, yeah, you know, I probably saw five police officers in total during my encounters there. You know, it was a yeah. small building. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, looking at this from like a cop perspective, first off, one of the first thing we would do is hope that there was closed circuit TV, you know, cameras by the restaurant, like most McDonald's have, you know, cameras now, maybe back yeah. then they didn't. Not, not then there was nothing. Yeah. yeah that's, that's unfortunate. Right. Or there's cameras around the bank deposit area too. That would be helpful, but every interrogation or interview is recorded both audio and video. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what happened to you could not happen today because, I mean, you don't start out with, here's a piece of paper, just wave your rights. Oh, really? No, yeah, no, no. It was no. a little card. It was like an index card. Yeah. And it I was mean, just a, said waiver of Miranda. I mean, the way it works is, you know, you sit down and if it's an interview, sometimes it depends where it's going. There's interviews and there's interrogations. Nobody likes the word interrogation anymore because, you know, negative connotations to it. So everything's an interview. And, <laughs> you know, if you're not a suspect and I you need to read Miranda, if a somebody is in custody, that means you're not free to leave. Mm -hmm. And B, I'm going to be asking you questions about a crime that I think you committed. So, you know, it's, so you don't incriminate yourself. Right. You know, and let you know that, yeah, if you want a lawyer, you can have one. And the way I always did it was, you know, it's like, you know, Matt, you're here today because, you know, we arrested you for stealing a car. You know, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, you know, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's like, but before we get any further, you know, I have to read this to you. You know, right. then, then you go through the Miranda warnings. Do you understand this? How far did you go in school? Do you speak English? You know, just mm -hmm. like basic stuff. Are you drunk? Have you been taking any drugs? You know, I just, you know, basic stuff that if you've been grilled by a good defense attorney, you're just cutting them off at the pass. Right. Because it's like, okay, well, you know, my client only went to seventh grade. You know, he doesn't understand this, you know, right. whatever the case may be. Yeah. So yeah, that, that just literally blows my mind. My second question would be when you were in jail, did anybody ask you like what you were in for? And you're like, I'm innocent. And it's like, yeah, right, buddy. Everybody in here is innocent. <laughs> well, I wasn't in jail for long. So, okay. you know, they arrested me that day. Actually, I was in the closet and uh, trying to decide what to <laughs> That's do. Unbelievable. I know. And, you know, the crazy thing was to this day, I'm sort of what I describe as a reluctant atheist, someone who has desperately tried to believe in a higher power and is just 
seemingly incapable of doing so. And okay. it's sort of always been that way. Okay. But in that closet, you know, I was so desperate. I said out loud, I said, God, should I confess to a crime I didn't commit? And it was the first time I heard like that sentence out loud. And I realized how crazy it sounded. <laughs> but until then, it didn't sound crazy at all until I heard it out loud spoken in that dark closet. And that was the moment that saved me. And I opened the door and said, I, I didn't do it. I'm not confessing. And they immediately arrested me. Well, and, there's, uh, there's no atheists in foxholes or closets, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, wow. But they brought me to the courthouse right from there. I mean, they they oh. they arraigned me or they, they fingerprinted me there. They put me in their jail for a little while. And then they okay. brought me to the courthouse and there was a jail in the courthouse. And that jail was a single room that I was put in. And I was in that room for about 12 hours. And then... Uh, and then eventually I was put before a judge mm -hmm. and uh, I asked the judge for an attorney. And uh, the judge said that I have a car. I had a 1992 Toyota Tercel in 1992. <laughs> I had not yet made a payment Ooh, you're on it. You're styling it, Yeah, I know. And I had yet to make a single payment on it. But he said to me, your car is newer than mine. I think you can get it yourself an attorney, son. Wow. And um, I said, but I'm going to lose my job, I think, now because of what's yeah. happening to me. And um, he basically was like, next. Now, had I had parents or anyone advising me, someone would have said, as soon as you lose your job, go back to the courthouse and they'll, sure. they'll assign you a public defender. But I didn't know. And there's so much shame involved. In, yeah. in, 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 and it's crazy because I didn't do anything wrong. I, I did something wrong in that I made a stupid mistake that I offered to correct. You right. know, I didn't steal money. I lost right. money. Sure, sure. And I, I didn't tell people what I was going through for a long time because I was just so embarrassed. Yeah. And so that's how I ended up with a $25,000 legal fee because I decided Ugh. if I'm going to go through this, I have to get the best attorney I can possibly get. So how long you know, was the trial or did it go to trial? It went to trial. It was wow. one day long. Was it a it jury was, or just by the judge? It was by the judge. The, the rules, I guess, at the time were I could go in front of a judge and if I didn't like his decision, we could go to a jury trial. So we mm. start with the judge and then go okay. to a jury if necessary. And um, the safe that the money came out of had an electronic key in it. So you would do a combination lock, but then you'd have to put your electronic key in. Mm -hmm. And so on the day of the trial, McDonald's gave my attorney a bunch of papers like discovery, you know, he finally sure. got it on mm -hmm. the day of the trial. And in that pile of papers was the electronic record of everyone who had gone in the safe that day. And it ended up yeah. being like 12 people. The safe was opened 85 times. Yeah. And that's all he needed to prove that anyone could have gone into the safe sure. and taken the money. And I remember telling my attorney, I was like, no, 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 I know all the people. They wouldn't have taken the money. And he's like, please stop talking. <laughs> You're not going to say anything. You're just going to sit in the chair and listen and talk when I tell you to, you know? Okay. So, you know, it, the, in the craziness of it, what happened was after I was fired from McDonald's, I became homeless. Eventually I, I lived with the goat. I went to work and I got two full-time jobs. One was for McDonald's. I worked for a franchisee instead of the corporation, someone mm -hmm. who knew me. And I also went to work for the bank where I was supposed to drop that deposit oh. because I happen to know someone that worked there too. <laughs> okay. And so the day of the trial, the bank and McDonald's were testifying against me and neither one oh. knew that. I was sort of the, the defendant until that day. And the judge said, I do not understand this. The bank that you work for is testifying against you. And McDonald's, who you work for, is testifying against you. And I said, I guess they don't really believe I'm guilty, Your Honor. And my attorney turned to me and said, shut your mouth. I told you not to say anything. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to be funny here. And he's like, it's not a place to be funny. Oh my gosh. Well, so it worked I'm, out in the end, but it cost me a lot of money and um, it cost me 18 months of my life. So yeah, that cost you a lot of grief. No doubt about it. It really it's, did. Yeah. It sent me so, back quite a ways. Sorry that happened. That, that yeah. That's horrible. Yikes. Um, speaking of McDonald's, you were a uh, night manager at McDonald's or whatever shifts that you worked, but you worked a closing and the McDonald's got robbed. Yeah, during this time, during all of this. Oh, during all this? Oh, was, my Lord. Yeah, it was the toughest 18 months of my life. Yeah, it was. I was working during at the bank during the day. Okay. I would go and work at McDonald's from 6 p.m. till 1 a.m. So, you know, that was that sort of like I was working, you know, 18 hours a day and sleeping six hours with the goat. And the goat's, so, you know, worried about you because you're not coming home at regular times. He's like waiting for right. you. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but so, yeah, I was working that night shift in the Brockton, Massachusetts McDonald's. So you get robbed at gunpoint. You're face down on this greasy floor. It, what's going through your head when all this is going on? Well, they wanted me to open a compartment of the safe that I couldn't open. You know, oh. the, it was one of those you drop the money down this back slot yeah. into a compartment. And there's a placard on the compartment that says manager does not have key. My, my owner had the key mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't believe it. And so they put my head, you know, that first they beat me badly. And um, when that didn't work, one of them put my head on the floor and put a gun to my head and said, I'm going to count back from three and then I'm going to shoot you in the head. And so um, a sentence I could not say for a very long time. I'm always like, wow, I said it. I can't believe it. Yeah. Uh, so he started counting, you know, and the crazy thing is that I didn't feel any fear or anger, hmm. you know, or even sadness in yeah. what felt like forever. And it was three seconds. It was just regret. It was, I'm 22. I'm lying on a greasy tile floor. And I really genuinely believe these were the last seconds of my life. And I just thought about how I've done nothing, how I had all these dreams and they kept getting forestalled by disaster after disaster. Sure. And, and I just couldn't believe I was going to, die having done nothing and so then he pulled the trigger on the gun and it was an empty gun which caused me a long time <laughs> a long time of difficulties oh yeah um, absolutely in an odd way it's the sort of the hinge point of my life it's the moment when i recognize what it's like to feel at the end of your life if you haven't accomplished things what hospice workers report all the time which is mm -hmm. You know, when people are 90 and they're in the last week of their life, the thing they talk about most is regret. The things they haven't done, the chances they didn't take, the the girl they never asked out, you know, right. in high school, they're still thinking about it to this day, that they had a chance to leave their job and start a business and they were too afraid to do it. All of those things, that's what people talk about at the end of their life. And I was thinking the same thing as a 22-year-old kid on a greasy tile floor. And so that was the moment that I decided... I can't end my life feeling regretful ever again. Like there will be a day when I reach my last day of my life. It was not that day, but when I get there, I do not ever want to feel that way again. Wow. Did they ever catch this robber? There was three of them and yeah. there, uh, and yes, they went and they tried to rob a bank and two of them died in the bank or, or oh. around, you know, during the bank robbery. And the third one made it back to his apartment. It was surrounded. And then he shot himself. Wow. So all three of them are dead. So, Wow. Did that give you any kind of closure? Um, I mean, it gave me closure in that I stopped worrying about them coming back for me, you know, but crazy things happen. You know, I, I struggled right. with PTSD for 15 years and then finally my wife, I met her and I woke up every night screaming and, um, yeah. you know, she said, you know, this isn't good. And I said, well, it's my yeah. thing. I said, you know, some people play tennis, some people collect <laughs> coins. I have nightmares every night. Hey, I'm not snoring. How's that, honey? <laughs> yeah. And she's like, it's not a thing. It's not collecting coins. Right. So, you know, it was closure in that I genuinely waited for them to keep coming back. But okay, uh, I still struggled mightily for a very long time. I was stupid. I should have just gone and talked to someone. But in 92, you know, nobody really like, yeah. checks in on you and goes, hey, you know, is there something going on that you know, so I constructed this weird life for myself where, I mean, I still do it to this day, like every room is inventoried for exits and entrances. And every mm -hmm. time I sit down, you know, there's no way I'm ever sitting with my back to the door. I just think that's insane. I catalog people coming in and out of every room or every restaurant and sort of identify their threat level in my mind. And you sound you like know, a cop. Yeah, yeah, maybe. That's what, that's I what don't cops, know. That is what cops do when we go to a restaurant or anything like that. I do the same exact thing. Really? Oh, absolutely. I look to see where the exit is. Okay, where's the kitchen? I look at the people coming in and out. It, what's that bulge under their coat or their shirt? You know, yeah. what are their hands doing? I mean, my back is to the wall. It drives my wife nuts. Yeah, it's just like you know. Oh, you have to sit here. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, 25 years of being a, a cop in a very busy city, etc. One thing that isn't portrayed in movies or social media or whatever are victims, you know, just dealing with these poor people that have are legitimate victims of just like 
and it doesn't even have to be like the most heinous crime. You know, I, I remember before I was a cop, I was a IHOP manager and I sold cars. I did all kinds of stuff and I bartended, you know, and our townhouse was burglar, uh, burglarized. And, you know, I mean, we just got married. I was 24 years old. We spent all of our wedding money on furniture, a cool 27 inch TV and a stereo. And it's like, so we're set. We come back after we're visiting my parents down in Chicago. And it's like the Grinch came, you know, the, the door yeah. is open and I'm just like, holy shit. You yeah. know, everything expensive gone, just gone. Right. And I tell you what, for like a week straight, I borrowed a pistol from a friend of mine. I sat on the couch. I had my wife stay somewhere else at a friend's house for a week. And I'm like, come on back guys, come on back. I'm waiting for you now. I mean, yeah. obviously it's not going to happen, but it totally screwed with my head and talking to victims of these different crimes. They tell me the same exact thing. Yeah. It's really, I couldn't move from one room to the next room. Like I remember I had a hard time walking around corners for a long time. Like it was really challenging. And for forever, I heard the click of that gun, you know, oh, God. my PTSD therapist, the, the thing he was sort of obsessed with first was let's get the click of that gun out of you. Because every time I heard it, you know, there was no click. It was just in my head. It would just click like everything would fire off in my body. So I haven't thankfully heard that in a long time. And I still have nightmares, you know, and the nightmare oh, yeah. is always exactly the same thing. I just, it's this, I just go through the robbery again, you know, in almost exactly the same way, but it's much better today. Um, Good. But well, I, nobody, you know, I didn't have parents to help me and nobody sort of said, Hey, you should go talk to somebody. Sure. So and you, like you, you said, figure out how to get through it, you know? And back then, you know, it wasn't as a it wasn't identified like it is today. And maybe it wasn't as accepted, you know, to go to a therapist and talk, right? To, you know, so, you know, thank God that that's changed. So that's, that's for the better. That's a good thing. Yeah. So while we're talking about cheery stuff like this, <laughs> <laughs> there's a well, quote it, in what it did change your, my life. So it was, you know, it wasn't all bad. I made something of it at least. Well, your book someday is today, 22 simple, actionable ways to propel your creative life. I really like this book for a variety of reasons. And one of them was you have a quote at almost every chapter, right? At the beginning of every chapter. And one that really yeah. caught my eye is a death quote, since we're being cheery here. <laughs> uh, death is not waiting for us in the marrow of every passing moment. She is a secret teacher hiding in plain sight, helping us discover what matters most. And that was Frank. Oh boy, I know I'm. Yeah, it starts with an O. Yeah, I know. I can't pronounce it either. Ostrowski. Yeah. He he works at Zen Hospice in San Francisco. Right. And he wrote a book too, actually. Yeah, he did. He has a lot of great things to say about this stuff. Yeah, and I did a little bit of research, and BJ Doctor BJ Miller also works at Zen Hospice, and he was a guest on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Oh. Okay, I didn't know and, that. And that is probably one of my favorite all-time podcast episodes ever. This guy is a triple amputee. Oh, and triple. He, he triple. Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, it's like arms, legs, and what else? But yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's got like half an arm and two legs that are amputated from the knee down. Wow. And he rides a bicycle. He he drives a motorcycle, and he went to medical school being a triple amputee i don't even know how that's possible to tell you the truth yeah because it's a very physically demanding job as well and the dexterity you're going to need for all that with one hand that's amazing to me but why did you pick that quote i i, I love it i think it's a great quote i think you know what it makes me think of is always how you know if we knew that we were in our last day of our life every minute would be precious to us but the problem is we wait until the last day of our life to start viewing minutes as precious when really the minutes we're living right now are equally precious. And yet we discard them like they're meaningless because we think there's a tomorrow and there's no guarantee of a tomorrow. You know, if we live our lives like no guarantees for tomorrow, then every minute can be made precious. And that means, you know, we can use them wisely as opposed to dithering them away as so many people do. So I think, you know, death sort of being that, ever-present teacher is the reminder that today is really valuable. You know, it's probably not your last day, but like my wife's uncle died on Saturday. 
unexpectedly. Oh my. He, he was cooking food when he passed away. He did not know he was in the last day of his life. And that is the truth for most people. Mm -hmm. The last day of their life is often a surprise to most people. It comes unexpectedly. And so we live our lives as if there's an infinite number of tomorrows when there really isn't and you never know. And so I just think that the more we can keep in mind that there that there's finite time that we have on this planet, that death is that quiet teacher, then the more likely we are to make the minutes we have today, just as precious as the minutes we have in the end. It's sort of like, I, I always think of it like a football game. You know, if you give up a field goal in the first quarter of a football game, oftentimes people are like, all right, that's fine. It's three to nothing. But when you get to the end of the game and you lose by one point, mm. right? That field goal in the first quarter that felt like nothing, it's worth just as many points in the fourth quarter as it is in the first quarter. And yet for some reason, we look at first quarter points as like meaningless <laughs> and true. we view fourth quarter points as precious <laughs> when really they're all equal. We should just start thinking of them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I totally agree with you. And this probably has, this can go along with that is in your book, you talk about a hundred year old plan. Can you explain that? Yeah. So it came right after my robbery. You know, I sort of started thinking about how I was going to live my life. And I came to the quick realization that, we make bad decisions on a daily basis in terms of how we spend our time. You know, if you ask me, how do I want to spend every day? I would probably tell you play golf and eat cheeseburgers. And <laughs> although both of those things are fine, they have to be done, you know, with some, you know, caution, you can't do both all the time. Right. And so we often live for immediate needs. And so the hundred year old plan is the idea that when I'm given an opportunity to spend an hour or a day, or I'm sort of given an opportunity to like, hey, do you want to try this thing? Or do you want to attempt this new endeavor? I don't ask the current version of me how I feel about it. I look forward to a, a visionary version of myself, what I imagine to be the 100-year-old version of me, lying in his deathbed with a week left to live, looking back on his mm. life. And I say to him, how should I spend the next couple hours that I have here, you know? And he never tells me to sit down on the couch and binge a Netflix show. He never tells me to look at my phone because I need to spend more time staring at social media. He never tells me to go get a cheeseburger. You know, he never tells me to do the stupid things that we do on a daily basis that cause right. us to regret our lives in the end. He always says to me, grab your son and go play catch because he's growing up faster than you even can imagine. Or he says, go play golf with your buddies because there's going to be a day when walking the course with the bag on your back is going to be hard and you're going to miss that. Or, or go sit with your wife. She's on the couch and she's reading a book and you want to read a book. So go sit with her and do that. That'll mean something to both of you. That version of me always has the right advice because that version of me understands time better than I understand it today. So whenever faced with a decision, time-based or just decision-based in terms of, should I take this risk? Should I try this new thing? Yeah, I just ask the future version of myself how I should better make those choices. And that person always has the best ideas. Wow. Okay. So what do you think of multitasking? It depends. I mean, it's, it's a trap for a lot of people because they think they can do lots of things at once. And, and, and a lot of things do require deep thought. So it's a trap in that a lot of things can't be multitasked in the way people believe. But I'll tell you today, I'm multitasked. Um, today, I watched the New England Patriots and folded a lot of laundry. I did both of those things and both were done perfectly well. I can tell you that I rode my bike and I'm listening to a book on the summer of the Revolutionary War, the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Mm. I was able to listen to that book and ride my bike at the same time. That was great multitasking. You know, I was able to multitask today when I was eating lunch and I was revising a novel that I'm working on because I can eat and read at the same time. So I can do all those things. And in terms of multitasking, those are all very possible. But when something requires deep thought, like if I wasn't revising a chapter, but I was actually writing new content, I really can't be doing anything, anything else, except yeah. maybe there's a cat in my lap and I'm petting the cat while I'm working. <laughs> sure. Well, that's a legitimate thing. Like I have a cat next to me right now. And I know from science that petting a cat actually imp improves my brain chemistry. Oh. And so, yeah, okay. so pet your cat. And you'll improve your brain chemistry, just like, by the way, riding a bike improves your brain chemistry, you know, any kind of exercise. So these little edges that I'm always looking for, um, they're meaningful. So 
writing a book while a cat is in my lap is a really great version of multitasking. But they well, have to be things like that. Okay. I might have to rent my son's cat. He has one. His name is Phil. <laughs> I was just up at visiting him in college uh, yesterday. <laughs> so maybe I'll bring Phil back because I've got a deadline. I, I'm writing like three books and they got to go out fast. So I'm like, well, a dog, Phil, a hamster, any kind well, of pet. Well, I have two old dogs and they just kind of like lay around a lot. So maybe I can okay. convince them to come near me so I can pet them and maybe right. that'll work. But anyway, so in the book, you talk about the eagle and the mouse. Could you explain that? <laughs> yes. You know, it came from my wife, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. So my wife's a school teacher and so am I. I'm an elementary school teacher. Um, I teach fifth grade. She's teaching kindergarten right now. But back in the day, we were both sort of teaching the same grade. And it was a report card time. And so I was working on report cards next to her. And I had headphones on and I was listening to an audio book. And I was actually playing online poker back when that could be legally done on the internet. Okay. And so I was doing all those things. And in a couple hours, I had finished all my report cards. I had made like 400 bucks in online poker and listened to a couple hours of an audio book all at the same time. And she had finished one report card. And I guess it made her crazy. She didn't tell me, but she went to work the next day to my boss, uh, our principal, a guy named Plato Carafellis. And um, she told on me sort of, she said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this guy because it took me in two hours to do a report card. And he did all of them and played poker and listened to a book at the same time. Like what she said, I'm so mad at him. What do I do? And um, he told her, he said, um, Matt's an eagle and you're a mouse. Um, in the On the Native American spirit wheel, or at least on one of them, there's sort of these four positions. And two of them are eagles and mice. And eagles fly above the world and see the big picture. They understand what's important and what's not. They understand what to spend time on and what can be, you know, what shortcuts can be taken. Whereas mice are down in the weeds and they are attention and detailed driven people. You know, they, they really pay attention to the little things, which is also super valuable. Sure. And um, the, that is the truth of the two of us. I am very much the eagle, which is I saw the report cards and said, all I really need to do is tell the parents that I love their kid, which I do tell them that I see their kid for who they are, a couple sentences saying, here's what I see from your child. And then telling the parent that I think we, they can still work harder, that I'm gonna get your kid to work even harder than they are right now. That's all I really needed to do. And every parent would be happy. Meanwhile, my wife is like calculating grades and you know, trying to decide, is this kid a, a two or a three? And I'm always like, just go with your gut, nobody cares. Like next month, it's not gonna matter if he's a two or a three. So it doesn't right. matter right now either. Uh, so. The problem is most people who are creating things, writers and artists and everyone who, who's making something, a business, they tend to be mice. And that's good because if you're writing a novel, you do have to pay attention to the details, right? right? Absolutely. But the problem with creative people is they're often only mice. And so they get absorbed in the details and they're unable to sort of get above the fray to take a look and say, oh, well, I don't really need to do this you know, and I don't need to do that. So oftentimes when we're working on something, no matter what it is, there's places where we don't need to invest our efforts and yet people do all the time. So if you're making something, if you're a creative person of any kind, you have to, you know, embody the mouse in many times in order to make your thing fantastic. While at the same time, finding a way to get above it all and say, what corners can be cut? What rules can be broken? You know, what parts of this project don't actually need my attention so that I can find the time, you know, to invest in the things that do require my attention. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. Oh, yeah. It, it, in a perfect world, we could be both. Yeah, like right. what you're saying, but it's not a perfect world. And yeah, I, I totally, totally see that. Now, you are an entrepreneur by far here. How many businesses do you are you into right now or you have run? Well, I have, I guess I have, it's funny. No one's ever asked me that. I guess I have three businesses running right now. I have a DJ business with a partner, you know, that's been running for going on 26 years now. We're sort of fading away a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. we're not looking for customers. They just come to us because okay. they've heard of us. We've done their sister's wedding, that kind of thing, but we're yeah. still, you know, we're still in the world. And then uh, my wife and I run an organization called Speak Up, where we produce storytelling shows throughout Connecticut and teach workshops. And um, I work as a consultant. I guess I have four jobs because I also work as a consultant for everything from Fortune 100 companies to 
you know, landscape painters and magicians, okay. anyone who needs communication. I do a lot of consulting, like a lot of consulting. And then um, I have a, a couple guys, an Israeli and a Canadian in me, and we're partnered up and I'm producing online um, content so that when people want to learn how to tell better stories and, you know, inject storytelling into their businesses, they don't have to necessarily speak to me. They can download my courses and ah. join our group and things like that. So I'm mm -hmm. running that business now too. Wow. So I'm an entrepreneur. A lot of people listening to this are, I think most authors are, you know, most writers are entrepreneurs. What's the best practices for someone starting a business and trying to sustain one from your years of experience, you know, what's worked, what hasn't. Um, I guess I'll give a few pieces of pieces of advice. First, if you can find a partner and it's a good one, that's going to help a lot, you know? So my DJ company, my partner is my best friend, my best friend from, you know, age of 16 on. Nice. And so that's been great. And yeah. we have, you know, the, the skills we bring, the skill set we bring, they're very different, which is beautiful. So, you know, I have a certain thing that I do well, and he has a certain thing that he does well, and we combine mm -hmm. together. For Speak Up, the storytelling organization that I run, I run it with my wife. She's actually the executive director and I'm the artistic director only because we had to give ourselves names one day. Uh, <laughs> okay. But it's great to have her working with me, you know, on everything and, and anything. And then, you know, my consulting business, I very much do on my own, but that's really me logging onto Zoom and talking to some vice president of some tech company. I don't need as much help there. Actually, I have production manager though. So no, I actually have some working for me mm -hmm. who's fantastic. She's, and she's a partner. I've given her a certain percentage of my business. Yeah. And then, um, and then I've got this team, the Israeli and the Canadian and me who are working together. So find good partners. That's important. And then the other thing is every great endeavor is typically what I call a thousand tiny steps. You know, you're, you're walking towards a horizon that's probably always going to be moving away from you to a certain degree. Sure, sure. But you have to acknowledge that's a thousand tiny steps. And that means that you don't have to do things necessarily in order, but you have to knock off all those steps. And that means every day you can probably do something. So I was helping a client. This is not a business person, but I was helping sort of someone in productivity. She told me she's always wanted to have a vegetable garden. And I said, well, that feels very attainable, you know? And she said, I know it's crazy. I don't have one yet, but I don't. And I'm not quite sure what to do yet. And I said, well, it's a thousand tiny steps to have a vegetable garden. One of those steps is you have to have some seeds, right? And she said, yes. I said, share your screen. We're going to go on Amazon. We're going to buy some <laughs> seeds, right? Okay. And that's important because like taking that first step is oftentimes the thing people never do. So yeah. many people tell me they're thinking about the book they're going to write. They're thinking about the business that they're going to oh, start. Yeah. And I always say thinking about a book and thinking about a business is you don't get any credit for that, right? I've published, you know, seven novels and two books of nonfiction. I didn't spend any time standing around and thinking about them. I wrote a sentence and then I wrote another sentence, you know? So taking action, even if it is, let's go to Amazon and buy some seeds, you know? And after that, we made a list of all the things that she had to do, which was like stake out the garden and find someone to deliver soil and buy some tools at the garden store and, you know, find some YouTube channels where you're going to learn how to garden all of these thousand tiny steps. But when you list them, you get to do them in any order that is convenient for the day. So if it's raining, she's not going to go outside and stake out her garden, but maybe she's going to go to the garden center and buy her, her tools, her hoe sure. and her, you know, so make a list of all the things that need to be accomplished and then acknowledge that you can accomplish them in any order and acknowledge that you must accomplish one every day, maybe more than one, but you've got to do something every day if you actually want to make something happen in life. Okay. I like that. That I never heard it explained exactly like that. I like that a lot. That's, that's awesome. Now in your book, you talk about the power of yes versus no. And no, it seems to be like the new cool thing, you know, yeah. to say no, you know, like life coaches and gurus and whatever else, you know, it's like, I just say no. And you're saying, say, yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you have a life coach, ask the life coach what they've ever done. Cause I've met a lot of life coaches who have no credits. Like <laughs> <laughs> I've met life coach and I say, oh, what have you done? You know? And they're like, well, I'm a life coach. And I say, I know, but what did you do before becoming a life coach? What's the thing that made you qualified to be a life coach? And oftentimes it's, you know, I raised my kids and then I took a class on life coaching and now I'm a life coach. Yeah. You know, I prefer life coaches who like, oh, well, I built a business and sold it or, 
you know, I've written some books or I don't know, I built my own house, whatever it is, like you have to have done something. Um, but I like yes a lot. I think that saying no is stupid. Um, <laughs> I think that saying no is an act of hubris. When someone gives you an opportunity and you assume you're not going to want to do it or that it's not going to be good for you, I think you just are foolishly making assumptions that you can predict the future. I always say that a yes can eventually become a no, but by initially saying no, what you're really saying is there's a door in front of me. There's possibility. I can push it open and take a couple steps through and see what the landscape looks like, or I can just say no and never open the door. I think that's the dumbest thing anyone can do. And when I track my life back, it is the unusual, unexpected, ridiculous yeses that I have said that have often yielded me the greatest results. You know, mm -hmm. I became a wedding DJ because my best friend Benji had a bad DJ at his wedding. And so he called me one day and said, do you want to be a wedding DJ? And I said, no, I don't. I know nothing about the business. I really don't know that much about music. And I've never had the desire to do so. But yes, I'll give it a try because the yes can eventually become a no. Now, 26 years later, I'll tell you, becoming a wedding DJ changed my life in deeply fundamental ways. You know, I perform all over the world now on stages. And part of the reason I'm successful is because for 26 years, I've been standing in front of groups of strangers and speaking extemporaneously. Mm. I've eliminated all my fear of ever standing in front of human beings, which is a huge barrier for a lot of public oh, speakers sure to is. overcome. Yes. You know, one of the weddings that I did was for my sort of second best friend in the world today, the guy who got me my season tickets to the Patriots. We've been going to Patriots games for 20 years, me and my friend Shep, whose wedding I DJed. His, the marriage didn't actually last, but the friendship did. And last year, his ex-wife, I was the minister at her wedding, at her second wedding for her new husband, because weirdly Shep stayed friends, very good friends with his ex-wife. So, oh, like, okay. But I never would have said yes to DJing unless I had this philosophy of yes. You know, my buddy asked me, do you want to write a rock opera? And I said, no, I don't like ro opera. I don't even know what it is, but yes, I'll give it a try. And we end up producing a rock opera. We, we, we produced it in a theater and now I write musicals. And I'm actually in the process right now of writing a musical that I will be performing in and singing in, even though I can't sing. <laughs> but none of those things happen if I say no to the thing that doesn't feel right to me. But I don't believe that I can predict the future. I think it's foolish to say writing a rock opera with my friend Andy Mayo will yield me nothing. That is hubris beyond belief to believe that you can predict that future. So you say yes to things. And then if it doesn't work out, if you're like, no, I gave it a try and it turns out it's a terrible thing then say no, then close the door and move on to the next one. But for goodness sake, there's going to be a day in your life when you're 83 and no one is asking you to do anything anymore. Sure. And you're going to regret the doors that you passed on because some life coach who accomplished actually nothing in their life told you to say no to things so that you can focus on what matters. You know, what matters is possibility, expanding your life, finding new avenues and roads to take. That is what matters. Awesome. Yeah. Another thing that kind of goes along with this in your book, you talked about make terrible things. I love <laughs> yes. that. Could you kind of expound on that a little? Well, perfectionism is a disastrous thing for all creative people. They just, they talk about making things and they don't do it because they're yes. afraid that the thing they're going to make isn't very good. And what we have to acknowledge is that every creative person in the world has made terrible things before they finally made something good. Absolutely. And you have to be in the pursuit of terrible things. My favorite one, I think, from my book, maybe, is the Richard Branson example. You know, the man who now is sending people, you know, to space and who, have, who owned Virgin Records, you know, that man. His first business was a parakeet business. He was yeah. selling parakeets. I remember this. This is good. And he eventually went out of business because the parakeets were reproducing faster than he could sell them. And so he had too many parakeets and not enough customers. And so he went out of business. Now, you know, can you imagine if he was like afraid to take a shot at the parakeet business, you know, he'd probably still be thinking about being an entrepreneur someday, but not quite sure how to make it work. Right. We, we just have to acknowledge it doesn't take, it's not hard to find either. Just it's easy to find lots and lots of creative, successful people who blundered and made terrible decisions and made rotten things before they finally found the thing that they, that, that was great. So we have to just let go of perfectionism and um, make lots of terrible things before we make the good thing.
Absolutely. Yeah, talking about writing, do you believe in writer's block? I I believe it probably exists for people, but I don't believe it needs to exist. You know, my answer to writer's block is you're not writing enough things. Okay. So was, my second know, question was how do you overcome it? Yeah, I just I just say write something else. So I have a novel that's under contract that I'm supposed to be writing. And I have a nonfiction book that I'm supposed to be writing the proposal for. Those are my two primary jobs right now. Mm -hmm. But if on a given day, I'm not feeling it with the novel and I'm not feeling it with the proposal and I'm never feeling it with the proposal. <laughs> but when I'm not feeling it, I have another book I'm working on, you know, sort of that quiet next book. Or I have a stack of envelopes there in the other room. There's a stack of envelopes pre-labeled with all of my students' addresses on them. Mm -hmm. And if I'm stuck, I'll take, an, I'll take one of those envelopes, I'll write a card to one of my students, stick it in the envelope and drop it in the mail because that counts as writing too. So, okay. you know, whatever writing you're doing, a writer's job is to put sentences on a page, whether that page is physical or digital. And that means if you're stuck on that day, then write a letter to your mother telling her how grateful you are that she has been in your life or write a letter to a restaurant telling them how, what a terrible experience you had last Tuesday, because that's writing too, applying sentences to the page so that you can become better at applying sentences to the page. So that's how we overcome writer's block. We just write different things until we can get back to the thing we're supposed to be writing. I love it. That's awesome. So what about people who are writers or authors, and usually it's younger people, but it doesn't have to be that really haven't lived life all that much, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I would think it would be difficult for them. You know, I, I'm in a lot of different writers groups, et cetera. And, you know, somebody's talking about, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm really stuck about ideas or whatever. And I might know them or kind of half know them. And it's like, you're afraid to come out of your basement, you know? <laughs> so yeah, you're, you know, my, my answer is go become a bartender, become a server, you know, what start dealing with people. You know, there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. Yeah. I guess for me, I always tell people that sort of like, if you just pay attention to the world, you'll find your ideas. You know um, you know, I've written a bunch of novels mm -hmm. and if I track the origins of all of them, almost every one of them comes from, someone said something to me and I went, huh, I'd kind of make an interesting book maybe someday. And then eventually that idea collided with another idea. And then I knew I had a book, but oftentimes I don't have to do anything except be attentive to the world. You know, so one of my novels was born from, I was listening to NPR one day and it talked about a mental disorder I had never heard before. And I thought, oh, well, that'd be an interesting element in a book. And I held it for 11 years, that idea. And then one day, another idea came along and the two of them fit perfectly together. Oh. And that became my last novel, The Other Mother, right? Okay. But I held on to that idea for 11 years before I found the other idea to come along and join the two together. And almost all of my books are, someone said something to me or I had a thought and then something else came along either someone said something else to me or I had a different thought and those two thoughts collide. I think what happens is we discard ideas and we discard notions and thoughts and things that people say. I think they hit us. I think someone, you know, someone says something to you and it hits you, but I think you lose it. You know, one of my novels is based upon a conversation I had in, in bed with my wife one night. You know, we were talking about childhood cruelty and she told me she said, Emily Kaplan once told me that uh, my bedroom is, was as big as someone else's bathroom, like, you know, making fun of the size of my bedroom. And I said, we should go find Emily Kaplan and tell her off today, you know? <laughs> and she said, no, it's fine, Matt. It doesn't bother me. And I said, well, it kind of does because you remember it, you right. know? And I said, wouldn't that be nice if you like were able to go back and find your high school bully and finally say what you've always wanted to say to them? I said, well, that would be an interesting book, I think. Don't you think? And she was like, go to bed. <laughs> but I was like, okay, that might be an interesting book. Now that idea required another idea to collide with it mm -hmm. in order to create the perfect comeback of Caroline Jacobs. But I didn't let go of the conversation. I wrote it down. You know, my agent always tells me that, you know, she says, you're a great writer. I love what you write. She says, but the best thing about you is you have an endless supply of ideas. And I think it's just because I listen carefully and I hold on to everything, trusting that someday 
the collision of two of these things are going to come together and I will have an idea for a book. And I've always had, I have more ideas for books than I have time to write them. And that's been the truth of my life. That's a good thing. Yeah, it is. A it's thing. a blessing. You know, it, it's it a really real is. wonderful. When it comes time for me to choose the next book to write, I often ask my agent and my wife, I say, well, here's my eight ideas. Which one do you think should I, I should choose? Because I've discovered that when I just do what women tell me to do, my life tends to turn out better. So I just ask the two of them and they collaborate and decide what book I should write. Awesome. I like that. So, you know, you're, you can be described as a master storyteller. You're um, you did these moth competitions and I didn't know anything about that until I heard you on that podcast. So I started doing some research and there's a, a moth podcast. Yep. And I think they had like some top, like whatever, you know, like some of their most favorite stories. And I was driving back from UW Stout where my son goes to college. And I was listening to these stories. I'm like, wow, this is really good. You know, again, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer. I have a lot of writer friends and, you know, it's a different format, but you're still telling a story. You know, what do you think are the best ways to start and end a story? Well, it's different, I think, on the page versus the stage. Okay, what do you think for page then? For page, well, I mean, I guess it's similar. There's similarities, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a little less rigid on the page because what the problem is, is when I stand on a stage, people need to be entertained or they will stop listening. Whereas if if you pick up my book, you're actually sort of saying to me, all right, I'll give you eight hours or at least I'll give you an hour. I'll I'll check out the first couple of chapters. They're affording you a certain amount of attention. Whereas on the stage, everything needs to be happening quickly, you know, but I often say that um, we need to start with on the stage. We we need to start with location and action, which is to say, I guess in the same way for a book, stuff needs to be happening. You know, a lot of times storytellers, whether they're authors or on the stage, they like to sort of lay out the world for us before anything ever happens. I call them one day stories. You hear someone talking for a long time and then they go one day and I always go, oh, that's where the story should should have started. Right. (laughs) Um, But they, they, they always feel like exposition is required beforehand. And it is not. What we want is we want something to be happening on the first page. We want to meet a person, you know, meet our protagonist or, or someone who will be integral to the story. And we want something to be going on. We want to feel like we're already in the story and not that it's getting revved up. You know, if you've ever seen like the movie Apollo 13, right? So in order to understand that film, you have to understand how 1960s space travel works. You have to know how those Apollo spacecraft work. Mm -hmm. But the movie doesn't start with Tom Hanks on a black screen saying, good evening, everybody. Before we watch this movie, I need to teach you about 1960s right. space travel so that you will understand what's about to happen. But that's how people write books and tell stories quite often, which is I'm going to teach you everything and then we're going to get the story started. What we prefer as readers is to be taught as we go along. You know, I'm reading right now The Lord of the Rings to my children. We just started the first chapter. Okay. And Bilbo is about to disappear. He's having a party and he's disappearing. Something is happening. And, and very early on, Tolkien says, you know, Bilbo has a large surprise for everyone in the Shire. And the kids are like, what is the surprise? And I say, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm happy that something's happening. Right. <laughs> it wasn't like, let me lay out Middle Earth to you. Let me explain to you the geography and the politics. And let me tell you about hobbits and elves and dwarves. It's none of that. It is something's going on. And I'm going to teach you about this world that we're in as we move through the world. So I think the best way to start a book or a story of any kind is to immediately place your reader or your audience member in the story and have something happening to hold them because that's what people want. Do you know the ending to your books right away? I don't. I know the ending to my personal stories because I've lived them. So I always say when I'm telling a personal story, I start with the end because the end informs all the choices that I make. Mm -hmm. But with my novels, I always start with a what if question. And I'm sort of very uncertain about the ending. I always have a prediction about what the ending is going to be. And now, now, because I write novels, I don't have to write the novel before I sell it. I sort of just have to write the, here's what I think it's going to be about. And my agent always goes, that's probably not the ending though, right? And I say, "I, I don't know, but probably not. And most of my books surprise me when I get to the end. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I always say writing my books is like 
it's like driving down a road without street lights and I've just got the headlights, you know, illuminating right in front of the car. And that's really all I can see. It's almost like reading my book while I'm writing it. You know, oh, cool. I have gasped out loud because something I wrote surprised me, which sounds crazy, <laughs> but it's true. Okay. All right. My wife has seen me weeping at, while writing the last chapter of a book, not because I'm sad the story is coming to an end, but because something has devastated me in the last chapter that I never saw coming. And now it's hitting me emotionally and I can't believe wow. it's happening. Yeah. So I never sort of know what's going to happen in my books. So you do not do detailed outlines. No, I tried for years. I did. And all those books were terrible. Um, okay. I think they work for some people, especially yeah, mystery writers. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, I went to, I, I struggled. I got an English degree in creative writing. I started writing novels, doing all the things I was taught, whiteboards and post-it notes and outlines yeah. and character lists. And all those books were bad. The only saving grace was that I knew they were bad 20,000 words in and I stopped and started something new. Um, so but do, I you went use to, any, do you use any specific writing software like Scrivener or anything like that? No, I just, just word. Just write in word. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I went to Boca Raton with my wife one year to visit her Nana. And um, Nana lived in a compound, like one of these elderly compounds mm -hmm. without Wi-Fi and no cable. And I got really bored really quick. And it was a Wednesday night and Nana had gone out. She had a date at the with the guy <laughs> named Joe at the ICU unit of the local oh, hospital. She said, all my boyfriends are dying. Oh, God. OK. So um, I was bored. And for the first time, I didn't have a whiteboard. I didn't have post-it notes. I didn't have an outline. And I had the idea for a book based upon something someone had said to me at dinner like three months before. Mm. And I thought it was going to be a short story. I, I told my wife, I'm going to write a short story. And it was the first time I'd ever written without an outline or a plan. And I discovered, oh, this is how I'm supposed to write. And it became my first novel. That's uh, outstanding. So for me, and for about half the writers I meet, we don't know what the hell we're doing. You know, <laughs> okay. we really have no idea. We're just writing and sort of revealing as we write. Cool. Now, you write a blog every day, correct? I do. For the last 19 years, I haven't missed a day. Why? Well, um, I guess for the same reason Jerry Seinfeld has written a joke every day for the last two decades. Um, Jerry Seinfeld once said, someone said, how do you write every day? And he said, well, I put a calendar on the wall and I wrote some jokes and I put an X on that day because I wrote jokes. And then the next day, I wrote some more jokes and I put an X on that day. And pretty soon I had mm. a chain that I didn't want to break because oh. why would you skip a day? Right. Right. And so I started blogging back in 2000 and like uh, 2002, maybe as part of a college class, I was taking a master's class in English and I yeah. needed an easy class. And I went, Oh, blogging. That sounds easy. And I started writing a blog for that class. And I loved the ability to sit down every day and say whatever the hell I wanted. I wasn't okay. forced to write like, you know, within the confines of my book. Yeah. So if someone irritated me, I could write about that. And if my friend said something funny to me, I could write about that. And if I saw something crazy, I could write about that. So I liked the freedom of every day I'm going to write something and it's just going to be what's on my mind that day. And, um, you know, you amazing things have happened from that as well. So do you suggest that, do you suggest that for new authors? Well, I'll tell you, it got me a really big audience, you know, over the years. Now, it took me a while to get that audience, but yeah, it's a good way to get an audience. It's a great way to warm up every day. You okay. know, it is the obligation that you have to write, which, you know, isn't always easy. You know, you know, I wrote on my wedding day and posted a blog. <laughs> and I wrote every day of my honeymoon and posted a blog. Okay. I write ahead sometimes. So like right now I have about five posts that are sort of evergreen. Mm -hmm. They can post whenever. And so, you know, the day that I wake up and I have pneumonia, I have a post ready to go. So I just have to click publish <laughs> and I'm good for the day. Okay. You know, so there is a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of that involved, but some of those blog posts have become columns that I've written. So, okay. you know, a magazine will call me and say, we'd like you to write a column about um, winter, about Christmas, let's say. Yeah. And I'll, the first thing I'll do is go to my blog and say, well, let me see what I've ever said about Christmas before. And, you know, 37 posts will come up with the word Christmas in them. And <laughs> pretty soon I find one that is basically the column I need to write. And I sort of gussy it up a little bit and then submit it. So it's nice to have all that content. You know, it's really great sure. to have 19 years of. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, absolutely. You know, millions yes. of words probably at this point. Yeah. Do you still do uh, stand up comedy? I do. Well, I haven't done it. Uh, since the pandemic. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm actually, I had a conversation with my friend today. I told him I'm going to go do it. 
And uh, if you want to do it, you've always said you want to do it. I'm going to do it. So um, it was really hard at first. And then it became easy because I was doing it. And then I stopped doing it because of the pandemic. And now it's going to be really hard at first again. But then it'll become easy again. Now you do these uh, moth story, what are they called? Story slams or? Yeah, I still do those as well. Now you do that stand up comedy. That takes a lot of you gotta have some big cojones to be doing that i think you know that that's not an easy thing to do in public speaking you know like we were talking before is one of the most dreaded scary things for most people yeah and you know they'd rather go to the dentist without novocaine than stand up in front of a crowd and say something what do you do to prevent stage fright or do you still get it I've I've never really had it. I can never really? remember it. Yeah, I can never remember a time. You know, stand up is hard because unlike storytelling, where all I have to do is tell a story and I'm sort of meeting the expectation. In yeah. stand up, you have to make people laugh. And most of the time when I'm doing stand up, I'm doing open mic stand up shows where there's just comedians in the audience. And so they don't want to laugh at you because that's a tough that crowd. Would, yeah. Yeah. So for me, that was the hard part was the idea that I'm going to bomb. Uh, but I wasn't afraid of standing up and speaking. I just didn't want to suck, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's that idea that I have to go and possibly suck. But once you do it once and you bomb, you're like, oh, well, that wasn't, that's not that bad. That's okay. I can do that again. Okay. Uh, but I've never been, had, I've never had stage fright. And, you know, I don't think I've ever met a performer who doesn't get nervous before performing, but I, I just genuinely don't. It's a combination of, stupidity and overconfidence and i don't know it, it's it's an odd thing but truly i've never been nervous in my life i just can't wait to get on stage when i have the opportunity wow th that's a rarity you know for me i had to do roll calls every day you know you had 12 minutes in front of a bunch of salty cops yeah and half of it was just trying to keep them awake or attentive especially when you're working late shift you know midnight to eight or yeah. whatever you know people are literally just like waking up or they've been up all day with a sick kid or whatever the case may be and you're trying to make it you're trying to entertain them and inform them at the same time that's perfect i i anytime you're standing in front of other human beings whether it's one or a million you should first be entertaining yeah if you're it, not you don't have them no one's listening if you're not entertaining well and i got it from some of the sergeants when i was coming up as a new cop you know, it's like, oh, my God, this, you know, it's like watching, you know, paint dry or, oh, cool. Sergeant Byer is going to be doing roll call today. I know he's going to do something funny, you right. know, and he always did. You know, and if he was like angry, then you're just like, oh, God, somebody really screwed up because he doesn't get angry very often. Yeah. And even that can be entertaining, or at least it's <laughs> it's different, right? It's keeping yeah, it's, your attention. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's definitely some attention going on. There's no doubt about that. It's so, amazing. It's amazing how people think that other people want to pay attention to them. You know, I take the stage every time assuming no one wants to hear anything I have to say. And therefore, I have to try to convince them that I have something great to say. And it just it astounds me when I'm in meetings and training sessions and even in storytelling shows when it just it's as if people think, oh, because you're standing there, we will give you our attention. And that's just not how the world works. But that's how no. people seem to think the world works. It's because that's what they do. It's because mm -hmm. they tend to be people who, if someone's standing in front of them, they inherently give that person attention. But that just means that they're like a rule follower or they're kinder than most mm -hmm. people. Okay. But you have to assume most people are despicable monsters <laughs> who want nothing to do with you. And therefore, you have to do something to get them to pay attention to you. <laughs> okay. And it doesn't mean funny. I always remind people that entertaining isn't always funny. It means you could say really interesting things. You could teach True. them something they didn't know. You could hold them with suspense. There's a million ways to be entertaining. Humor is one of them, but there's many, many other ways to do it. Yeah, you know what? Yes, yes, that that's that's great. So with these um, storytelling competitions and doing stand-up, how do you memorize all this stuff? Because I imagine you don't have like note cards or anything like that. No, well, I don't believe in memorizing. I believe in remembering. Okay. So I don't, memorize word for word i remember what i need to say and so every time you hear me tell a story it's going to come out a little different it's still mm. going to have like i'm going to start in this scene and this is what i have to do and then i'm going to go here and this is what i'm going to have to do 
but most of the time, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, somewhere between memorization and remembering. Now, admittedly, I'm an auditory person. I can kind of remember everything that is ever said to me. Oh. I'm also not visual in any way. My wife and I were driving home one night after living in this house for 10 years. And on the way home, we were talking about houses. And I mentioned that we live in a yellow house. And she said, we do not live in a yellow house. We live in a tan house. And I said, it's yellow like the sun, honey. And when we pulled on the street, I looked and thought, oh my God, I don't live in a yellow house. So that's how non-visual I am. Right? Okay. My wife says, line, line up 10 brunettes, all about the same size, put me in the lineup. He can't pick me out, which oh, is not like, true, of course, of but course there's not. truth behind it. So I am a little gifted in that I'm non-visual, but exceptionally strong in an auditory way. It's why I was a debate champion in college. Oh, okay. I just let people talk and I remembered everything they said. And then I used all their words against them. So that helps too. But, but you have to dispel with the idea that you have to memorize anything because this is not a play or a monologue. You just remember what happened or you remember the joke. But um, you're not going to memorize it. You know, if you're a professional comedian, you are going to memorize it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're memorizing 15 minutes of a set and you're just doing that set over and over and over again for, the, you know, for a year. So that's sure. a little easier. Gotcha. Um, for me, I'm just thinking, oh, I'm going to go up and talk about pinatas. Right. I'm working on a joke right now about pinatas. And I'm not going to remember every line perfectly, but I'm going to talk about how they're sort of I, I describe them as asshole identification devices. <laughs> Because pinatas are designed so that only the worst children at the party get the candy. Because all the polite and patient ones never get any candy because they wait like they're supposed to. And it just allows all the monsters to get all the candy, which is why I hate pinatas. They're disastrous things that people put up at parties and they just make good kids cry. But I won't like remember it perfectly when I go up and do it. I might eventually find lines that I'm like, oh, that line nailed it. I got to remember that one. But I'm still going to be playful with the language. Love it. Love it. Um, let's start wrapping this up. One of the things that I really liked about your book was your section with the importance of celebrating. Could you kind of touch on that? Yeah. The problem with people is that they often feel like they have to get over the biggest finish line on the planet before they get to celebrate anything. So my friend Jenny finished her first novel. And I told her, your job now is to have a party. And the party is that I finished a novel and you didn't party, right? And you you bring everybody over and you eat cake and we dance and do whatever you wanna do because you wrote a novel and that's amazing. And what happens is most people don't celebrate until sort of, you know, well, I need it to be published in a bookstore. I met an author once who said, I'm never gonna celebrate till I make the New York Times bestseller list. And Ooh. I thought, you're just Ooh. an idiot. Yeah. So every step of the way, remember that, thousand tiny steps in order to yeah. achieve a goal don't celebrate every one of the thousand but there should be mile posts along the way you know there should be like i earned the first dollar of my business i'm going to have a party there should be you know i i opened the doors on this day i'm going to celebrate i it, it should be you know i've doubled the amount i charge for clients i just doubled the amount and they said yes i'm going to celebrate <laughs> in some way we deserve to you know we deserve to celebrate the 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 milestones that we achieve and when we do it's it's nurturing to our soul to to do that you know my my um my backyard garden client you know she she's going to tell me well i'll celebrate when you know at the end of the season when all the vegetables grow and i say no you're going to celebrate the day you plant the vegetables sure right the day you put those vegetable those seeds in the earth that's the day to celebrate and then the first day that like you see something poke from the earth, let's celebrate on that day. And then, yes, yeah, celebrate when you harvest your crop at the end of the year. That would be great, too. But if we just wait, like that's a disastrous and terrible formula to make sure you feel bad all the time. No, oh, I love that. And I think that's a good place for us to stop. Uh, where can people find out more about you and your books? Well, if they go to MatthewDix.com, they can sort of find out everything there. But if you want a book, um, you can get them wherever you get books, you know, online or ideally in bookstores, you can find my books there too. Outstanding. Well, this has been a lot of fun and informative. So thank you so much, Matthew. My pleasure. Thanks so much for talking to me.